Dubai Valley International Airport. But during security screening, an alarm went off. TSA officers opened the suitcase and found a circular compound approximately three inches in diameter wrapped in a wax-like paper and clear plastic wrap hidden in the lining of the baggage. They called the FBI and an x-ray showed the device contained a granular type of powder consistent with a commercial grade firework. They say it had multiple fuses attached, one designed to ignite quickly. The suitcase also containing a can of butane, a lighter, a pipe with white powder residue, a wireless drill with cordless batteries and two electrical outlets taped together with black tape. Law enforcement believes the device posed a significant risk to the aircraft and passengers. According to the FBI, once the device was discovered, Muffley was paged over the airport's PA system and told to report to the security office. Instead, they say he left the airport. He was taken into custody soon after. Trevor all joins us now from Allentown. Trevor, what comes next for the suspect? Well, we're expecting this suspect, Mark Muffley, to make his first appearance in court tomorrow, Lindsay. Of course, we're still w waiting on that big question to get an answer of what was his potential motive for allegedly trying to sneak that explosive device onto the plane. Lindsay? Yeah, such a key question at this point. Trevor, thank you. Now to the dramatic scene today in the Alec Murdoch murder trial, with jurors going to the crime scene in person before prosecutors made their closing arguments, painting a vivid picture of the night of the murder. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the very latest from South Carolina. With a security escort, the jury in the Alec Murdoch trial today making a rare visit to the crime scene where prosecutors say the disgraced lawyer shot his wife and son to death. Jurors spent an hour on the family's sprawling 1,700-acre property walking around the crime scene near the dog kennels, the bullet holes still visible. Just hours later, the jury was back in the courtroom hearing prosecutors make their final case against Alec Murdoch. There is only one person who had the motive, who had the means, who had the opportunity to commit these crimes. The state arguing Alec Murdoch was about to be exposed for his financial crimes and was facing pressure from his family about his opioid addiction, so he killed them to buy time and gain sympathy. The pressures on this man were unbearable and they were all reaching a crescendo the day his wife and son were murdered by him. Prosecutors describing in chilling detail how Murdoch first shot his son, then his wife at close range with the family's weapons. Maggie sees what happens and she comes running over there, running to her baby. The state then pointing to Murdoch's string of lies, denying he was at the crime scene until that kennel video emerged, proving he was there minutes before the murders. Why in the world? Would an innocent, reasonable father and husband lie about that? As they wrap their case, the prosecution asking the jury to remember the victims. Maggie and Paul deserve a voice. Pleading for them to convict Alec Murdoch. He fooled Maggie and Paul too, and they paid for it with their lives. Don't let him fool you too. Powerful closing argument on such a riveting case. Eva Pilgrim joins us now once again from South Carolina. Eva, what happens next in this trial? So, Lindsay, the defense begins its closing arguments tomorrow morning, and then the state will have a chance to respond. After that, the judge will charge the jury, giving them instructions about how to consider this case, and then it's time for deliberations, Lindsay. Eva Pilgrim for us. Thanks so much, Eva. Now to a shocking development involving a star NFL prospect expected to be the top pick in this year's NFL draft. Today it was revealed that top player Jalen Carter, a defensive tackle for the national champion University of Georgia Bulldogs, has been charged with reckless driving and racing in connection with the car crash that occurred the night of the Bulldogs' victory celebration in January. The arrest warrant came down just minutes before Carter was expected to speak at the NFL's draft combine. ABC Steve Osinsami has the very latest from Georgia tonight. Police in Georgia tonight are sharing 911 calls and surveillance videos from a deadly crash that are now threatening to end a promising professional football career before it's even gotten started. I got one in the car one on the ground. Former University of Georgia defensive lineman Jalen Carter was expected by many to be this year's top pick at the NFL draft. Carter's going to be, if he's not the first pick in next year's draft, he'll be a top five pick. But authorities say he is one of the drivers seen here waiting in a black SUV at a traffic light shortly before they say the two SUVs went on a drunken high-speed race through city streets. 
killing 24-year-old Chandler LaCroix, a recruiting analyst, and offensive lineman Devin Willock, who was seated behind her on January 15th. The owner of this iPhone was in a severe car crash and is not responding to their phone. It was the night of the big parade. UGA had just won its second national football championship in a row, and it was a party. The Georgia Bulldogs on an incredible accomplishment. Today is the first time most people may have had any idea Carter had anything to do with the crash. Police have charged him with street racing and reckless driving, both misdemeanors. He was in Indianapolis at the NFL Combine lobbying for a job where he canceled his press appearances. Instead, he put out a statement saying he will return to Georgia to answer the arrest warrants, saying there is no question in my mind that when the facts are known, I will be fully exonerated of any criminal wrongdoing. We will see how this all plays out. Steve Ossin Tommy joins us now from Atlanta. Steve, what else are authorities saying about the circumstances of the crash and, and Carter's role that night? Well, police are saying that the, according to their toxicology reports that they've gotten from the incident, that the young woman who was driving the SUV, and this is an important point, they say that she was driving drunk. And they also say that based on what they can see from the surveillance video, from evidence that they have from that night, that they believe she was driving more than 100 and four miles an hour through city streets. They also, though, say that at the time, Carter, who was at the scene, left the scene, then came back to talk with investigators, but he told investigators that he wasn't racing and that he wasn't driving fast, which tonight, Lindsay, police say, just isn't true. Lindsay. Steve Osanzami for us. Thanks so much, Steve, as always. We head overseas now to a tragedy in Greece after a head-on train collision left more than three dozen dead and many more injured. Greek police say a station master is now under arrest. ABC's Marcus Moore has the details for us tonight. Tonight, horrific new video showing the moment a packed passenger train traveling more than 100 miles per hour slammed head-on with a freight train in Greece. A massive fireball erupting. Greek state TV obtaining these images. Flames reaching temperatures of more than 2,000 degrees. The impact sending passengers flying out of windows. And tonight, Greek television reporting the two trains were traveling on the same track for 11 miles, racing toward one another for 12 minutes before tragedy struck. This man, his head still bleeding, saying his train car caught fire. He and his friend, along with a woman and child, escaping through a hole. Another survivor saying the collision felt like an earthquake. Night has fallen once again here in Greece, and because of safety, they are not using the heavy equipment and cranes here at the crash site, but they have not stopped their desperate search for survivors amidst the wreckage. At least 43 people killed in what is now the deadliest train crash in Greece's history. Most of the victims between 20 and 30 years old. Nearly 60 people remain hospitalized. The horror unfolding shortly before midnight Tuesday in Tempe, four hours after the passenger train departed Athens. Many passengers asleep, heading home from a carnival celebration. And several top officials resigning, including the country's transportation minister. Authorities calling the crash a case of, quote, tragic human error. Arresting the station manager responsible for directing train traffic, charged with causing mass deaths through negligence. So many of these accidents on the railways lately. Marcus Moore joins us now. Marcus, do authorities think that there's still hope for more survivors? They have not given up hope, Lindsay. Uh, as you heard us mention in the piece, they were using cranes and, and heavy equipment to lift the wreckage you see behind me, but because of safety, they are not doing that any longer. But they haven't left the scene here, Lindsay. Right now, they're continuing the search for people who are unaccounted for. As authorities try to answer the crucial question, how did no one notice these two trains were on the same tracks for 12 whole minutes? And Lindsay, I have to tell you, it is absolutely a heartbreaking scene here in Greece. I can imagine. All right, Marcus Moore for us. Thanks so much, Marcus. A review by the U.S. Intel community of Havana Syndrome, the set of medical ailments experienced by U.S. government officials and military personnel abroad, found that it's, quote, very unlikely that a foreign adversary or energy weapon is the cause. Instead, the director of national intelligence said in a statement that the events, which are referred to officially as anomalous health incidents, were probably the result of other factors such as pre-existing conditions, conventional illnesses, and environmental factors. However, some of the victims have denounced the Intel assessment and are calling for the, quote, 
shrouds of secrecy to be lifted. To Ukraine now, where the battle for the eastern city of Bakhmut is becoming the battle for the future of the country. Ukrainian President Zelensky is now sending military reinforcements into the major city after the Russians surrounded Bakhmut on three sides. It's the latest development in the war. ABC News correspondent James Longman filed this report from the ground. Tonight, Russia's desperate attempts to conquer the East met with fierce resistance. Here, Russian tanks crossed Ukraine's frozen landscape and then obliterated in a huge cloud of smoke. <laughs> Heavy losses on both sides in the battle for Bakhmut. More than 70,000 lived here before the war. Now, there's almost nothing left. This as Belarus President Lukashenko, Putin's closest ally, met with President Xi in Beijing. There are growing fears that China may seek to arm Russia. The two men touted China's 12-point plan for peace, a proposal which doesn't say Russian troops should leave Ukraine. Putin is preparing to host Xi in Moscow this spring. And today, Secretary Blinken saying there is zero evidence that Putin was ready to engage in serious peace talks. Our thanks to James for that. Paul Vallis and Brandon Johnson will meet in a runoff to become the next mayor of Chicago after voters denied incumbent Lori Lightfoot of a second term. Lightfoot, the first black woman and first openly gay person to lead the city, won her first term in 2019 after promising to end decades of corruption and backroom dealing at City Hall. But opponents blame Lightfoot for an increase in crime that occurred in cities across the U.S. during the pandemic and criticized her as being a divisive, overly contentious leader. She's the first elected Chicago mayor to lose a re-election bid in 40 years. Four people suspected of becoming involved in the shooting that killed an Israeli-American citizen earlier this week were initially apprehended by Israeli authorities on Wednesday, Israeli Defense Forces said in a statement. When officials arrived to apprehend the four people, two of the suspects attempted to flee the scene. Two were killed while the other suspects surrendered as they exited their homes. The two suspects who surrendered were then transferred for further questioning. The arrest came the same day hundreds of Israeli protesters demonstrated out outside the House of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Wednesday during a nationwide day of disruption, raising the intensity of protests against a government plan to overhaul the judiciary. Now to some major medical news. Eli Lilly, one of the largest pharmaceutical manufacturers in the world, has announced that it's cutting the price and capping out of pocket costs on some of its insulin products. The move expands on last year's Inflation Reduction Act that imposed a $35 monthly cap on copayments for Medicare patients. And it's certainly welcome news for the more than 8 million Americans with diabetes who depend on insulin to survive. ABC Stephanie Ramos has more. Tonight, in a major move that will bring relief to millions of Americans with diabetes, pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly says patients using their insulin will only pay up to $35 a month out of pocket. We're doing this completely voluntarily because it's, it's time and it's the right thing to do. Eli Lilly also cutting the price of its most commonly prescribed insulin, Humalog and Humulin, by 70% this fall. Its generic version of Humalog dropping to $25 a vial in May. The news comes as the company and other drug makers face increasing pressure from President Biden to lower insulin prices. Just last year, Biden signed a law capping insulin prices for seniors on Medicare. Nearly 3 million Americans with diabetes are using Eli Lilly insulin, including J.P. Qualters, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 10. Even with two different health insurance plans, he says the prices are just too high. For anyone above 26, in my personal opinion, you could pay up to four to 600 to $800 a month extra on top of your health insurance payments for one vial or three vials of insulin. Some much needed relief for those who rely on insulin. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, President Biden has, of course, put a lot of attention on this issue. What was his reaction today? Well, tonight, Lindsay, President Biden called the announcement a big deal, adding it is time for other manufacturers to follow. We do want to mention those that are uninsured will need to sign up for Eli Lilly's insulin program before qualifying for that discount. Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos for us. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Still much more ahead to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a couple's legal fight with an IVF clinic. Why the major mix-up, they say, resulted in their child likely facing a lifelong cancer battle. Actor Christoph Waltz on his new limited TV series and why he doesn't like to use the word villain to describe his characters. But next, one of the women at the center of a criminal case against Harvey Weinstein had remained anonymous, but now she is telling her story publicly and explaining why she chose to come forward. You have to fight just for yourself, just for other victims.
for our kids. And you can win. My story is an example. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Back now with a story of strength and resilience. And all dozens of women say they were abused by Harvey Weinstein, but only a select few cases went to trial. One woman at the center of those criminal cases had remained anonymous throughout those trials until just recently. In her first televised interview, she says she wants her story to be told in the hopes that she can help others, including her own daughter. ABC's Kana Whitworth has this emotional report. They want my story going to be an example, but you can stand. You can fight a, fight a monster, you can win. She's one of the key figures whose testimony helped bring down a Hollywood Goliath. To all the victims, it is our victory. I did my best. I won, but this is our victory, not only mine. Evgenia Charnyshova, known as Jane Doe No. 1 for years, ready to finally come forward in her first television interview 10 years after Harvey Weinstein assaulted and raped her in Los Angeles. I was a really happy woman. This changed everything. She hopes her story can now help others after a Los Angeles jury convicted Weinstein for raping her, sentencing him to 16 more years of prison. That's why we say me too. More than five years after the allegations against him sparked the Me Too movement, Weinstein could now spend the rest of his life behind bars. You have to stand up. You have to go forward. You have to fight just for yourself, just for other victims, for our kids. And you can win. My story is an example. Sorry, sorry. For decades, Harvey Weinstein was one of the kingmakers in Hollywood, one of the most thanked names at the Academy Awards. I would like to thank Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein, who believed in us and made this movie. Thank you, Harvey Weinstein. At least 100 women, including Angelina Jolie, Selma Hayek, and Gwyneth Paltrow, allege that Weinstein sexually harassed, abused, or assaulted them. The time for survivors to rise up and thrive has come. Evgenia watching woman after woman step out in front of the cameras, but unable to do the same. I became a Jane Doe to protect my minor kids. I did know that being Jane Doe, it's a life with no identity. Being a Jane Doe, it's a hell. 
The Russian-born Italian model and actress says she briefly met Weinstein at three different events in the 2010s. I didn't know who he is. You didn't I, know the power that he held in Hollywood at that time? I, no, I didn't know. Did you ever email him or have a conversation with him? Never. You never asked him for anything? Never, never. In 2013, Evgenia was a VIP guest at the Los Angeles Italia Festival when she says Weinstein forced his way into her hotel and sexually assaulted and raped her. I heard his banging on, on the door and he was loud. I know it's him because he was saying his name and I was really embarrassed and I opened this door. I regret the thing for a decade, for the last 10 years of my life that I did open this door. Just days after the rape, Weinstein was at the Oscars with his then pregnant wife celebrating wins for his films Django Unchained and Silver Linings Playbook, while Evgenia returned home to Italy, trying to resume life with her kids as normally as possible. I was feel dirty. It was a moment that I, I could not be like mom, uh, touching my kids or taking care of them. I separated from my husband because my marriage had been affected. She eventually moved to Los Angeles with her family for work. And in 2017, she brought her young teenage daughter, Maria, to the Italia Festival when Weinstein approached their dinner table. I was paralyzed, you know, like we're just looking at each other because he wanted to sit right by me. And he moved somebody. He said, no, I'm not going to sit here. It was just jump. I took the glass with alcohol and went out to the balcony to smoke. And when I came back, he wasn't there anymore. But I drank a lot that night. It was shocking. Maria says she noticed her mother's demeanor change immediately around Weinstein. But Evgenia continued to stay quiet until later that year, when her daughter's own traumatic experience prompted her to finally speak out. I was sexually assaulted and terrified at the moment. I was only 15. And after months of very, very brutal bullying and harassment, I got really scared for my own safety. I just blurted it out, really. I didn't think there was a perfect way to tell yes. something like this to my mom. I didn't know how she would react. And then you found out that she knew all too well what you were talking about. It was utter shock to hear that my mom, the person that inspires me the most, someone so kind could have undergone something so, so horrifying. I have to, to tell her that I really understand what she's feeling. Because if I wasn't, she will repeat my mistake. She will hide this and will live with this forever. And everyone from the old generation always encouraged us to deny. I decided to break this circle. And I convinced her to go to the police. And we make a deal. I promise her that's I will go to the police. Maria did go to the police and received a temporary restraining order against her alleged perpetrator. Evgenia also went to the police and on January 6th of 2020, Los Angeles County prosecutors charged Weinstein with rape and sexual battery in connection to Evgenia and another Jane Doe. We believe the evidence will show that the defendant used his power and influence to gain access to his victims and then committed violent crimes against them. That very same day, Weinstein went on trial in New York, eventually convicted of rape and sexual assault and sentenced to 23 years in prison. This was a game changer. The most powerful guy in Hollywood, not just being convicted on some minor violation, but getting a very serious prison sentence that could keep him behind bars for the rest of his life. Almost three years later, Weinstein would face trial in Los Angeles. He faced seven counts in connection to four women, including Jennifer Newsom, wife of California Governor Gavin Newsom, who had come forward publicly. Evgenia 
was the first witness. Weinstein and his lawyers claimed he never even met her. Her daughter, Maria, was the second witness, called by prosecutors to verify her mother's story. In that moment, I felt that I was getting my closure, and I walk out of that courtroom crying. Tell her mom, I feel amazing. I feel good, and I feel like... I felt like myself again, and it's, it's been a long time. After a month-long trial, the jury convicted Weinstein on three counts. Last week, she gave an impact statement at Weinstein's sentencing in front of a packed courtroom filled with other accusers. She spoke for all of us. Everything that she said was the journey that all of us took all of these years as survivors. I'm so happy that our voices are heard now because you mess with the wrong girl, oh, yeah. <laughs> Harvey Weinstein. Weinstein's Los Angeles conviction could prove crucial if his legal team successfully appeals his New York conviction. The key arguments are that the trial was unfair, that there was evidence that was admitted that shouldn't have been admitted against him, and that one of the jurors had been working on a book about older men who prey on younger women and that she should have never been on the jury. The reason Weinstein's team is at least a little hopeful is the fact that the Court of Appeals has even agreed to hear the case. But Evgenia has since found bigger purpose after coming forward, her resolve to fight now stronger than ever. I want he don't have the more the possibility to hurt anyone anymore. I don't want this person with his power can hurt anyone else. I think this is this is justice. What a powerful interview. Our thanks to Kena for that. Still much more ahead to get to tonight. Coming up, millions of kids are spending hours a day on TikTok. The new controls the app is releasing to help parents reduce their children's screen time. But next, there may be some relief for renters after prices skyrocketed. We take a look at how much the costs are decreasing by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Two of the hottest rappers coming out of Atlanta. Young Thug and Gunna. Charging a sweeping 56-count indictment. What is this? Rap is back on trial. You decide to admit your crimes over a beat, I'm going to use it. What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison. We're not going to let that happen on our watch. Not with hip-hop music, using our lyrics. We're going to fight back. Rap, trap, hip-hop on trial. Only on Hulu. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This might go. 
Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Disturbing is the word to describe this story. Master manipulator Larry Ray terrorizing his daughter's classmates. More than a decade of abuse. Psychological torture, sleep deprivation, sexual humiliation. That's only the half of it. I want to get up! Watching the documentary for the first time was so emotional. I have no memory of that happening. If he wanted to get to you, please. He would. Under his spell, Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. There may be some much-needed relief for renters as new reports show skyrocketing rents appear to be leveling off. And it comes as home mortgage demand reaches a new low. Let's take a look by the numbers. Two recent reports put median rent in the U.S. in January at $1,942, according to Redfin and Rent.com. That's down from $1,978 in December. And it's down from last summer's peak of $2,053 a month for median rent in August. What's driving the recent drop? Vacancies are up as demand has slowed and more new construction is available, leaving some landlords needing to compete for tenants. But in February 2021, the median rent was just $1,635, meaning prices today are still well above their levels from two years ago before rent started to soar along with overall inflation. Meanwhile, home prices have dropped now for six months straight, according to the latest Case-Shiller Index, and sale prices have dropped about 4.4% from their recent peak last June. Mortgage demand is also at its lowest point in 28 years, according to an index from the Mortgage Bankers Association. That's because higher mortgage rates, which now average some 6.7 percent for a 30-year fixed mortgage, are keeping many buyers away. The Federal Reserve has hiked interest rates a full 4.5 percent since last March as it attempts to tame still high inflation, driving up mortgage rates. With more interest rate hikes still to come, mortgage rates will likely remain elevated, meaning that home prices could continue to drop as demand stays cooled off. We still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. Academy Award-winning actor Christoph Waltz talks about playing memorable antagonists on screen and changing tones for his new comedy TV series. And on the road to the Oscars, the creators of Puss in Boots on how they managed to tackle some tough topics in a way that children can understand. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
I have to admit, I wasn't expecting to be asked to host the Oscars again, but... Well, let me be perfectly clear. You were not my first choice. In fact, we asked a lot of people before you. Well, I'd rather not know who they were. Let me tell you. Steve Martin, Steve Carell, Steve Buscemi, Steve Austin, Steve Seagal, Steve Urkel. Steve from Blue's Clues. That's just the Steves. Did you ask Steve Harvey? Begged Steve Harvey. He would have been good. Steve Harvey would have been incredible. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Anyone who abducts a child, you're probably twisted beyond untwisting. People don't understand how you can keep relentlessly fighting. But Morgan is worth fighting for. Morgan! All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back to Prime. After an unspeakable tragedy at a game studio based in downtown Los Angeles, a mysterious consultant played by actor Christoph Waltz blows into town and takes charge. Trevor Alt is back with us and sat down with the actor to discuss his Prime video series, The Consultant. Our CEO is gone. <laughs> and then we arrived. It's fantastic to talk to you. Thank you. I'm loving the trend of highly decorated movie actors, actors who have won Oscars stepping into the role of streaming with these uh, mini-series, basically, because you get so much more time with the character. Is that part of what drove you to this role? I like to know what the end is. You know, I think um, I have this highfalutin idea that the beginning is actually in the end, mm -hmm. meaning as a dramatic uh, form. So I like one, one story that starts and ends, and, and that's where it's reaching towards the end. Mm -hmm. now, especially with television series, the end is being <laughs> pushed, pushed, right. pushed, pushed. Uh, you know, come, come to the point, please. <laughs> but that's the other art form. I'm very interested in the fact that every person that I talk to in this building and in my life that I said I was going to be interviewing you, the response was the same. I love him, he's so scary in prior roles, namely with the Tarantino films, but everything really. You come across, I know I just met you, as a very likable man. What is it that allows you to access these sinister characters? You're talking about your perspective. Yes. I, I, I'm, yeah, well, or, or they are talking about theirs, you know. Yes. I don't know what they mean. <laughs> are villains more fun to play? In your um, opinion? I don't even know what a villain is. I call it the V word that I avoid like the plague. Mm -hmm. um, um, because it's, it's a label. And it's, it's uh, a simplification. And it's a reduction. And uh, a, a reduction to an abbreviation in, in mm -hmm. communication. And... Um, abbreviation to the degree where it robs you of the interesting part. Mm -hmm. What kind? Um, what are the specific qualities? So that's what I concern myself with. This series is set, it's a pretty heavy uh, satire in many ways of office culture. How do you think you would fare working in an office environment? I, I would fail on every level. <laughs> I would fail as a minion in obedience, and I would fail as a boss in abusing authority. <laughs> so it's a good thing I'm not working in an office. I won't be here forever, will I? I'm only the consultant. You're the executive producer on this series, too, so how'd you do as a boss in that regard? I, I, an executive producer is not a boss. <laughs> no, uh, it's, not. It's, it's a euphemism for you can say what you want. Whether we listen to it or not mm -hmm. remains to be seen, but, you know, mm -hmm. it, it just gives you 
uh, a, a little, your argument, a little more weight sure. for possible consideration. Is there anything specific that you look for in a role? I want to do justice. I want to, to um, suffice. I want, mm -hmm. to, I want to really try to understand who that person is and then get out of his way. Right. That's how I try to do it. For those who work remotely, you have one hour to get here or you'll be terminated. He's firing Ian. He says he doesn't like the way he smells. Bow your heads and pray for him. What drew you specifically to this character, Regis Patoff? That you can put up a lot of backlights and always, and like a shadow play on, on, the, on the wall, always come up with a different silhouette. And all you need to do is move the light a little bit, you know, as you see a new shape. So this is, this is, um, I, I keep coming back to that word because it's a beautiful word, unsettling. Mm -hmm. Because you tend to settle into your first impression. But unsettling... He definitely does. It unsettles a lot uh, from what I've seen so far. You also don't seem like you take yourself all that seriously or yourself as the actor's actor. What is the balance of those two things in your life? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, in a, really lucky, uh, in as much as I find, um, as the old saying goes, a job worth doing is a job worth doing well. And that takes me out of myself. And that's all there is to it. Looks super compelling. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Next, the major areas letting their COVID mandates expire. Plus, TikTok is rolling out parental controls and two parents file a lawsuit after being given the wrong embryo. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. Major milestones in the fight against COVID-19 in two different parts of the world. Hong Kong today became one of the world's last cities to drop rules demanding face coverings after first implementing strict mandates in July 2020. Meanwhile, in the U.S., Los Angeles County is set to end its COVID-19 emergency declaration on March 31st. The move was approved by the Board of Supervisors Tuesday, the same day California Governor Gavin Newsom lifted the statewide emergency declaration issued three years ago. In Missouri, a man was found dead and a woman was taken into police custody after a long standoff that began when three Kansas City police officers were shot. The Missouri State Highway Patrol said the residence was secured and an investigation was ongoing. The woman had no injuries. The three officers were shot last night as they tried to execute a search warrant at the residence. All three were said to have non-life-threatening injuries and were hospitalized in stable condition. Elaine Maxwell asked a federal appeals court to overturn her conviction and 20-year prison sentence for helping Jeffrey Epstein sexually abuse underage girls. Maxwell's conviction was based on the testimony of four women, three of whom were permitted to testify under pseudonyms. Maxwell's attorneys said that transformed the trial into a form of kabuki theater that put the protection of the adult women above Maxwell's right to a public trial. The defense also argued Maxwell was charged with time-barred offenses that should have been blamed on Jeffrey Epstein, who died by suicide in prison. A California couple has sued the fertility clinic that gave them an embryo for their IVF procedure that tested positive for a deadly cancer gene. Melissa and Jason Diaz said they went to the Huntington Reproductive Center so they could have IVF with pre-implantation genetic testing to avoid having a child with Jason's mutation for a rare gastric cancer. According to the lawsuit, the clinic mistakenly transferred and implanted an embryo that had been identified as carrying that gene in early 2021. The couple conceived a boy, now one year old, who according to the suit will either develop the gastric cancer or need a total stomach removal surgery. TikTok has announced new ways to help teens limit their time scrolling through videos. New parental controls are being introduced. TikTok says users 18 and under will get a notice if they're on the site for longer than one hour a day. The new measures were released as the House Foreign Affairs Committee voted to send a bill to the floor that would give President Biden the authority to ban TikTok in the United States. 
A New Hampshire snowboarder took a wild fall in an avalanche. In a moment caught on video, the snowboarder was dragged down with a large slab of snow at Tuckerman's Ravine at Mount Washington over the weekend, partially burying him. The snowboarder and a skier that was coming down the mountain at the same time were both reportedly okay. Making a kid's movie is an art form that is more complex than it may seem on the surface. Take a beloved character coupled with easy humor and integrate jokes for adult and mature themes so it can transform into a film that anyone can enjoy. That's the kind of picture director Joel Crawford and producer Mark Swift were hoping to create when working on Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. It's a sequel to a spinoff that didn't just earn a nomination for Best Animated Feature, it's also getting rave reviews for tackling sensitive topics like anxiety and mortality. I had the opportunity to talk with Joel and Mark about their Academy Award nod and the strides that animated movies are making. First time nomination, right? Yeah. Exciting, guys. How did you find out the news? I think I was uh, getting my kids ready for school, and <laughs> and I found out that uh, we were nominated, which which is overwhelmingly like just awesome it's a huge surprise my phone started buzzing next to my bed and i was <laughs> like i knew the nominations were coming up so i was waking up going to sleep waking up going to sleep and i fell asleep for the nominations but then my phone went off and i was like that's a good sign oh. hey slow down i know what i'm doing <laughs> what what What's funny? Nothing should be funny. You all have both spoken to this before, that animated movies aren't quite taken as, as seriously. How do you push back on that notion that it doesn't really get its, its proper respect? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a thing where I think there's been this kind of idea that animated movies are for one kind of audience and are supposed to do one thing in terms of comedy or adventure. And um, for us, I think you push back by continue to push the boundaries of what animation can do and show audiences that that animation can actually deliver some um, more mature themes. Are you supposed to be a fearless hero, a legend? Rick, this is a person party. That's your party. So this is where dignity goes to die. Puss in Boots has done where it's resonated not just with families, but teenagers, 20 years old. You know, it's it's been awesome to see the reception it's received. I would say, like, within our movie, we have a, a Puss gets a panic attack mm -hmm. in the movie. Puss, what's wrong? And we play for real. And I think that's a thing that a lot of people in their life go through. And it's amazing how much that's resonated with um, adults and kids and people who go through panic attacks. Of course, cats are known to have nine lives. You all managed to really talk about mortality in, in this movie. Kind of tell me what the the intention was, because most many people are going to be looked like, oh, you know, this is just for kids, this is kids. But there really is that, that double meaning. When we approached the project, the, what excited us was, on the surface, there's kind of this absurdity of a cat on his ninth life, and it feels like a fairy tale. But as in our conversations, we found, like, for us, it's about embracing mortality. And when you do that, you can actually appreciate how special life is. And so, you know, in terms of, like, there's a lot of, like, kind of parallel themes in this story. Some, um, in a big way, are about vulnerability and taking a character like Puss in Boots, who, you know, has been around for so long, is so iconic, um, and is almost this kind of superhero, and delving into what's underneath kind of the facade of looking perfect, looking um, invincible. We don't just think of Puss in Boots as a cat. In, in us, we were picturing Puss in Boots more as like a, a rock star, Mick Jagger, <laughs> yeah. and kind of treating him like that. And so I think, of course, he's a cat. We have fun with him being a cat, but we treat him like a, you know, a fully fledged rock star and, and think of him in that way. Tell me about how, because one thing that I've always been impressed, you know, taking my son to go see an animated movie, the ones that really strike me are the ones that they actually have two messages. There's like a parallel structure that he's laughing on one level at, at a little joke, and the adults are laughing at, you know, the, the, the loftier concept. All right, let's get it on the way. How 
difficult is that to have those kind of intertwined messages and, and themes and jokes throughout a movie? I would say um, we make the movies for ourselves. And you'll find this a lot in animation where um, we're all adults, we're making these movies, so obviously that stuff appeals. But we're all very childish as well, and so it's very easy to lean into the stuff that we think would be funny for a eight or nine year old because we still think it's funny. So I think we kind of strike that balance. Yeah, and, and we also, I mean, I think a lot of those kind of um, the, the humor that plays for kids, but also there's another layer for adults, is also found from our cast. We have an amazing cast in Puss in Boots, and we improvise a lot. Was there a particular movie that you saw growing up, or as an adult perhaps, that you said, you know, this is this is for me, this is what I want to do? Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. the tongue on the, on the pole. <laughs> I remember at the age when I went to the theater and saw Dumb and Dumber, there was this experience of a whole theater laughing spontaneously at the same time. And I'm like, I love movies because it's this, this thing that is so magical, where, whether it's it's laughter, whether it's it's drama, it's something that human beings from all walks of life are experiencing at the same time because of what you put on the screen. So that one was just, it was this great visceral reaction. Yeah, I think I grew up when the Disney films were being re-released in movie oh. theaters. That was always a treat, go and see Pinocchio or Snow White. And it seems such a distant dream growing up in England and these movies being made in America. But um, yeah, I finally got them. Congratulations, guys. Thank we'll you. Be pulling for Thank you. you. This All is right. awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Find out how Crawford Swift and, of course, Puss in Boots fare in the Academy Awards ceremony by watching the Oscars on ABC Sunday, March 12th at 8 p.m. And tomorrow, my conversation with a director who took a real life thriller story and made it into a movie, Daniel Rohr talks about the bombshell admission in his Oscar-nominated documentary, Navalny, a shocking and detailed look at the poisoning of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who remains jailed as the Russians forge a bloody war on Ukraine. Finally tonight, on the first day of Women's History Month, meet the awesome women behind the movie Elvis, which has received eight Oscar nominations. They have some advice for the next generation of female filmmakers. Rihanna Nally has their story. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Elvis Presley. Baz Luhrmann's Elvis biopic is a hip-shaking, hard-rocking spectacle. The movie tells the true story of the king of rock and roll, but it transports its viewers back in time because of the women behind the lens. From an early age, I loved cinema and storytelling and photography and art. It seemed like the natural place for me to be is to be a cinematographer, to, to kind of incorporate all the things that I loved. And yet, did you have a role model, a woman who was a cinematographer you could look up to then? I did not. No, there was nobody. Just the third woman ever nominated for Best Cinematography, Mandy Walker executed precise recreations of real Elvis footage and put on her dancing shoes. Very, very early on, I remember Baz saying to me, Mandy, the camera has to dance with Elvis. So I always had that in the back of my mind and that we, we literally would be on stage with him and learning his movements and feeling as one with the choreography. Meanwhile, Karen Murphy and Catherine Martin got creative building Graceland and nailing Elvis's legendary looks. In Graceland, his sofa, for, for example, is like 15 feet long and he would have had it custom made, so we custom made it. And it was hard for us to get it into our set, so we couldn't understand how Elvis must have got it into his own home. Often people say to me, did you film that at Graceland? <laughs> so that, that's a big compliment. There's been a lot of talk about the new Elvis. As an art department and in the costume department, how do we make Elvis relevant to a youthful audience? How, through images, through clothing, through environment, do we connect audiences? Elvis nabbed eight Oscar nominations this year thanks to this powerhouse team of women who have some advice for the next generation of female filmmakers. To me, the best advice is just to do it. Mm. Volunteer at the local drama society, make their costumes, build their sets, 
find young filmmakers who need help. We're still only, I think, 6% of cinematographers are women, but it is getting better. I say to most of them is to not feel daunted by that. Be confident. And if you are passionate about following this as a career, to just be focused and push on through. Got to push on through. Our thanks to Rhiannon for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Rapper Travis Scott is wanted for questioning by police what a man claims the performer did to him at a nightclub. And a fisherman describes the wild scene when his boat came across a shark feeding frenzy. What happened next? With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Disturbing is the word to describe this story. Master manipulator Larry Ray terrorizing his daughter's classmates. More than a decade of abuse. Psychological torture, sleep deprivation, sexual humiliation. That's only the half of it. I want to get out! Watching the documentary for the first time was so emotional. I have no memory of that happening. If he wanted to get to you, please. He would. Under his spell, Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. I'm Martha Raddatz in Lviv, Ukraine. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A review of Havana syndrome by the U.S. intelligence community finds it, quote, very unlikely that a foreign adversary or energy weapon is the cause. Instead, the director of national intelligence said in a statement that the events, which are referred to officially as anomalous health incidents, were probably the result of other factors such as pre-existing conditions, conventional illnesses, and environmental factors. However, some of the victims have denounced the intel assessment and are calling for the, quote, shrouds of secrecy to be lifted. 
Paul Vallis and Brandon Johnson will meet in a runoff election to become the next mayor of Chicago after voters denied incumbent Lori Lightfoot a second term. Lightfoot, the first black woman and first openly gay person to lead the city, won her first term in 2019 after promising to end decades of corruption and backroom dealing at City Hall. But opponents blame Lightfoot for an increase in crime that occurred in cities across the U.S. during the pandemic and criticized her as being a divisive, overly contentious leader. She is the first elected Chicago mayor to lose a re-election bid in four years. Travis Scott is wanted for questioning by police after a man claimed the rapper punched him in the face at a Manhattan nightclub early on Wednesday. A sound engineer who works at Club Nebula told authorities that he was in a verbal dispute with Scott that escalated into a physical altercation around 2 a.m. The 52-year-old victim alleged that the 31-year-old Scott punched him in the face and did $12,000 worth of damage to an audio speaker and a video screen. Next to the possible air disaster averted, a checked suitcase with an explosive device inside caught by authorities before it was put onto the plane. Tonight, a suspect is under arrest. Tonight, we're learning new details about where the explosive device was inside the bag and how, in this instance, at least, the system worked. But just how bad could this have been? Trevor Alt reports from Lehigh Valley International in Allentown where the bag was found. Tonight, the FBI says this man tried to smuggle an explosive device onto a passenger plane in one of those suitcases he's wheeling behind him. According to the criminal complaint, 40-year-old Mark Muffley checked the suitcase Monday onto a flight bound for Orlando, Florida from Pennsylvania's Lehigh Valley International Airport. But during security screening, an alarm went off. TSA officers opened the suitcase and found a circular compound approximately three inches in diameter wrapped in a wax-like paper and clear plastic wrap hidden in the lining of the baggage. They called the FBI and an x-ray showed the device contained a granular type of powder consistent with a commercial grade firework. They say it had multiple fuses attached, one designed to ignite quickly. The suitcase also containing a can of butane, a lighter, a pipe with white powder residue, a wireless drill with cordless batteries, and two electrical outlets taped together with black tape. Law enforcement believes the device posed a significant risk to the aircraft and passengers. According to the FBI, once the device was discovered, Muffley was paged over the airport's PA system and told to report to the security office. Instead, they say he left the airport. He was taken into custody soon after. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Now to the dramatic scene today in the Alec Murdoch murder trial with jurors going to the crime scene in person before prosecutors made their closing arguments, painting a vivid picture of the night of the murder. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest from South Carolina. With a security escort, the jury in the Alec Murdoch trial today making a rare visit to the crime scene where prosecutors say the disgraced lawyer shot his wife and son to death. Jurors spent an hour on the family's sprawling 1,700-acre property walking around the crime scene near the dog kennels, the bullet holes still visible. Just hours later, the jury was back in the courtroom hearing prosecutors make their final case against Alec Murdoch. There is only one person who had the motive, who had the means, who had the opportunity to commit these crimes. The state arguing Alec Murdoch was about to be exposed for his financial crimes and was facing pressure from his family about his opioid addiction, so he killed them to buy time and gain sympathy. The pressures on this man were unbearable and they were all reaching a crescendo the day his wife and son were murdered by him. Prosecutors describing in chilling detail how Murdoch first shot his son, then his wife at close range with the family's weapons. Maggie sees what happens and she comes running over there, running to her baby. The state then pointing to Murdoch's string of lies, denying he was at the crime scene until that kennel video emerged, proving he was there minutes before the murders. Why in the world? Would an innocent, reasonable father and husband lie about that? As they wrap their case, the prosecution asking the jury to remember the victims. Maggie and Paul deserve a voice. Pleading for them to convict Alec Murdoch. He fooled Maggie and Paul too, and they paid for it with their lives. Don't let him fool you too. 
Powerful closing arguments there, thanks to Eva. Now to a shocking development involving a star NFL prospect expected to be the top pick in this year's NFL draft. Jalen Carter, a defensive tackle for the national champion University of Georgia Bulldogs, has been charged with reckless driving and racing in connection with a fatal car crash that occurred the night of the Bulldogs' victory celebration. ABC's Steve Osinsami has the latest from Georgia. Police in Georgia tonight are sharing 911 calls and surveillance videos from a deadly crash that are now threatening to end a promising professional football career before it's even gotten started. I got one in the car and one on the ground. Former University of Georgia defensive lineman Jalen Carter was expected by many to be this year's top pick at the NFL draft. Carter's going to be, if he's not the first pick in next year's draft, he'll be a top five pick. But authorities say he is one of the drivers seen here waiting in a black SUV at a traffic light shortly before they say the two SUVs went on a drunken high-speed race through city streets killing 24-year-old Chandler LaCroix, a recruiting analyst, and offensive lineman Devin Willock, who was seated behind her on January 15th. The owner of this iPhone was in a severe car crash and is not responding to their phone. It was the night of the big parade. UGA had just won its second national football championship in a row, and it was a party. The Georgia Bulldogs on an incredible accomplishment. Today is the first time most people may have had any idea Carter had anything to do with the crash. Police have charged him with street racing and reckless driving, both misdemeanors. He was in Indianapolis at the NFL Combine lobbying for a job where he canceled his press appearances. Instead, he put out a statement saying he will return to Georgia to answer the arrest warrants, saying there is no question in my mind that when the facts are known, I will be fully exonerated of any criminal wrongdoing. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami. Next tonight, to what's left of that massive storm that has left parts of California still unreachable days after dumping down feet of snow. Tonight, that system is sparking severe weather and possible tornadoes in the heartland before pushing east. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. Hey, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. You know, it's already been a dicey evening here in the Mid-South with storms coming through. We are in the tornado watch here in Memphis. It's a big one across four states. Take a look. Memphis down to Tupelo, back through Texarkana and up through uh, Little Rock. This is in effect until 10 o'clock tonight. And again, just a warm up for really what's going to come tomorrow. That's from the storm that's coming out of California now in through Arizona. Phoenix getting some storms, snow flying uh, north of there in through the four corners. And the storms will erupt tomorrow afternoon, nearly across central and eastern Texas. And then maybe a couple of waves of this, the main bullseye of strong tornadoes possibilities, Dallas down to Lufkin, through Texarkana, south, basically the same areas that are getting hit or have the threat of getting hit tonight, damaging winds, large hail and tornadoes, some of which could be long track and, and strong. That will press to the east during the day on Friday, and then the northern part of this will get in the way of snow. Uh, late Friday, Chicago through Detroit, upstate New York, New York City as well, Kind of a messy rush hour Friday night, and that pushes into uh, Boston and New England overnight. It's going to be a, a bit of a mess along I-95, but inland areas will once again see some significant snow accumulations with it all ending, hopefully, by midday Saturday. Another high-impact coast-to-coast storm. Lindsay? You know, one perhaps final winter wall of there. Rob, our thanks to you as always. We head overseas now to a tragedy in Greece. A head-on train collision left more than three dozen dead and many more injured. Greek police say a station master is now under arrest. ABC's Marcus Moore has the details tonight. Tonight, horrific new video showing the moment a packed passenger train traveling more than 100 miles per hour slammed head-on with a freight train in Greece. A massive fireball erupting. Greek state TV obtaining these images. Flames reaching temperatures of more than 2,000 degrees. The impact sending passengers flying out of windows. And tonight, Greek television reporting the two trains were traveling on the same track for 11 miles, racing toward one another for 12 minutes before tragedy struck. This man, his head still bleeding, saying his train car caught fire. He and his friend, along with a woman and child, escaping through a hole. Another survivor saying the collision felt like an earthquake. Night has fallen once again here in Greece, and because of safety, they are not using the heavy equipment and cranes here at the crash site, but they have not stopped their desperate search for survivors amidst the wreckage. At least 43 people killed in what is now the deadliest train crash in Greece's history. Most of the victims between 20 and 30 years old. Nearly 60 people remain hospitalized. The horror unfolding shortly before midnight Tuesday in Tempe, four hours after the passenger train departed Athens. Many passengers asleep, heading home from a carnival celebration. 
and several top officials resigning, including the country's transportation minister. Authorities calling the crash a case of, quote, tragic human error, arresting the station manager responsible for directing train traffic, charged with causing mass deaths through negligence. Our thanks to Marcus for that. Now to some major medical news. Eli Lilly, the pharmaceutical giant, is cutting the price and capping out-of-pocket costs on some of its insulin products. It's certainly welcome news for the more than 8 million Americans with diabetes. ABC Stephanie Ramos has more. Tonight, in a major move that will bring relief to millions of Americans with diabetes, pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly says patients using their insulin will only pay up to $35 a month out of pocket. We're doing this completely voluntarily because it's, it's time and it's the right thing to do. Eli Lilly also cutting the price of its most commonly prescribed insulin, Humalog and Humulin, by 70% this fall. Its generic version of Humalog dropping to $25 a vial in May. The news comes as the company and other drug makers face increasing pressure from President Biden to lower insulin prices. Just last year, Biden signed a law capping insulin prices for seniors on Medicare. Nearly 3 million Americans with diabetes are using Eli Lilly insulin, including J.P. Qualters, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 10. Even with two different health insurance plans, he says the prices are just too high. For anyone above 26, in my personal opinion, you could pay up to four to six hundred to eight hundred dollars a month extra on top of your health insurance payments for one vial or three vials of insulin. Our thanks to Stephanie for that. Certainly welcome news there. Turning now to incredible video of sharks in a feeding frenzy off the coast of Louisiana. A fisherman who came across this wild scene is now opening up about what will be an unforgettable day, likely for the rest of his life. ABC's Whit Johnson has the details. Chaos in the water off the coast of Venice, Louisiana. Ah. Dozens of sharks in a feeding frenzy, the water appearing to boil in a stew of gray fins. Fisherman Mark Hardesty says they were out on his boat searching for yellowfin tuna when they came across this wild scene. All of a sudden, we started experiencing the schools of just frantic feeding uh, sharks that were devouring uh, bait pods and uh, they erupted all around us and then up under the boat. The sharks darting violently under and around the boat, sending a spray of water on board. <laughs> it's soaking wet. Hardesty says they were about 15 miles off the coast when they first noticed the top water disturbance and realized it was a large pod of Manhattan fish. But as they moved closer, the sharks suddenly appeared. If the person had fallen into that frenzy, you would not have found them again. Mark says he's been fishing in the Gulf for 15 years and shark sightings are becoming more frequent. But this day on the water is one he'll never forget. We couldn't even fish around them because they took every line we had. It, it was just a mess. A mess is right. Our thanks to Wit. Still much more I had to get to tonight. For years, an MIT scientist and professor thought that the sexism that she faced was an exception to the rule until she found out she was not alone. What she did to fight the system. Also, how a man lost in a jungle managed to survive for weeks before being rescued. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. 
A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there it is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Thousands of workers in Sri Lanka staged a one-day strike to protest against massive increases of taxes and electricity rates by the government. Most banks across the country were also closed for the day, and parts of a hospital were closed as other unions participated in the strike. Sri Lanka had raised electricity prices by 66% at a move the government hopes will persuade the International Monetary Fund to provide a bailout for its crisis-stricken economy. The Independent National Electoral Commission declared Bola Tinubu as Nigeria's president elect, but many Nigerians told Reuters that they were unhappy with the process that led to his victory. The vote was meant to be the nation's fairest and most open contest to date, but the electoral process encountered problems owning to the new technology that did not function well and seemed to overwhelm Nigeria's notoriously inadequate communications network. And in Bolivia, a man who had been lost in the jungle for nearly a month was finally found alive. The video of the rescue was, shows 30-year-old farmer Jonathan Acosta looking understandably depleted and needing help to walk. He told local media that he survived by eating insects and worms. He was transported to a local hospital and is said to have lost about 37 pounds. She is one of the foremost scientific minds in cancer research, and for years, Nancy Hopkins believed the sexism that she faced was the exception until she started talking to other women working at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The fight of these professors for gender equality on campus is now the subject of a new book by New York Times national correspondent Kate Zernicki. I spoke with both women earlier this week. Thank you both for, for talking with us today. Nancy, I'd like to start with you. You'd obviously had made great strides in your cancer research. You were looking at the world of science like a meritocracy, right? And then there was a certain point where you realized the sexual harassment, the assault was not necessarily just an exception for you, but, but more like the rule. At what point did you realize that it was a pattern for not just you, but, but many of your female colleagues? It took about 20 years. <laughs> I was so certain that if you did a good enough experiment, none of it would matter. Mm. So I saw it from the beginning, but I didn't know what it was. And I just thought, well, this is some obstacle. I did something wrong. Maybe I ran into a difficult person. I'll just keep going, keep going. And um, it really took a while. So after a while, I, I said, well, wait a minute. You know, this is really a little too difficult. And some of the things were sort of obvious that, that had to do with being, but I didn't think they mattered. But there were some I just didn't know. And so I started looking at how other women were treated. And that was what opened my eyes to it. I said, wait a minute, that woman is just as good as that man. How come he's the genius and she's treated sort of invisible? I mean, this doesn't make sense, really. And I had to see enough examples so that I really finally knew it was true. And there weren't many women, so it took a long time. But the interesting thing was that even when I saw it, it was really all those other women, I still was able to convince myself that it wasn't happening to me. That I, you know, my problems were some individual problem or whatever, I'd done something wrong, somebody else done something. Very hard to face the fact that this is happening to you. I'm curious if I can play devil's advocate here for a moment. At what point, because you said that you, yourself, it, initially you thought, well, maybe it's just me, maybe it's just an issue that I'm having. At what point did you decide, and really you were clear, that it was about your gender and not you personally? Well, I think certainly it took about 15 years to realize it was all other women except me, and then it <laughs> made this big switch. And then I realized, yes, okay, it's happening to me, but I can still overcome this if I can just get through this one difficult, more problem. And then there was 
the last straw moment when I just realized I couldn't continue to actually work that way. I'd run out of energy to fight these battles. At what point did you realize? Was it kind of like a call, a knock at a door, when you went to a, a female colleague and said, are you having these struggles? How did that all transpire? I exhausted all the local administrators, and I wrote a letter to the president of MIT. And I said, dear sir, I'm sure you're a well-meaning person, but honestly, you're discriminating against all the women faculty here, and I think you ought to do something about it. And so I really looked up to this woman, but I thought, she'll think I'm a loser and a wimp if I... But I'm going to show her the letter anyway and just see whether it's dignified and, you know, persuade, and the president might even read it. So we go out to lunch, and we're sitting at this tiny little table, and I'm watching her, and she's reading it so slow, so slow, and I'm waiting her for say, oh, that Hopkins woman, she's no good, you know. And, I, and she's reading, and she puts it down on the table, and she says, I'd like to sign this letter, uh -huh. and I think we should go and see the president, because I've believed this for a long time. That's great. And that changed my life. It changed MIT. And we looked at each other, and we said, you don't suppose it could be others <laughs> who feel the same way, do you? Well, guess what? <laughs> there were. How did you first hear about Nancy's story? So I was a reporter at the Boston Globe, and I just got a very generic tip. I still, to this day, can't remember where it came. It was like, you know, through several people, call this woman Nancy Hopkins. There's something about discrimination in women at MIT. And I thought, OK, it's 1999. It's probably, you know, a lawsuit or something. It, you know, what, how bad could it be, right? 1999, we're on the verge of a new century. So I called Nancy, and she said that they had produced this report about discrimination, but what really got me was that MIT was going to acknowledge that it had discriminated. And the reason MIT had done this is because the women had been so careful to gather data, to gather stories, to make their case. And, you know, the men who, uh, MIT ultimately, the president of MIT said, this is a real problem. Were you all expecting the headlines and the shockwaves when you first revealed this no, problem? No, I thought it was a great story because, as I said, MIT was admitting this. I loved the way these women had gone about this scientifically. It just struck me as this very MIT story. And I was really impressed by them, but I didn't think, like, it showed up on the front page. So I do the story for the Boston Globe, it shows up on the front page. I didn't think it was going to show up on the front page of the New York Times two days later. I thought, OK, but it's just these kind of places like Harvard and MIT, you know, which is, you know, think they're so great. <laughs> and um, it didn't occur to me, actually, that it was true everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how, how naive can you be? It, I'm sort of embarrassed to say it, but I have to be honest here. So uh, then when this report, uh, Kate's article came out, this deluge happened. I mean, it was just overwhelming. And women were writing from all over the country, literally the world, and saying, thank you, thank you for telling the story. It's my story. And this was back in 1999. Why did you decide now was the time, we're talking more than two decades later, for a yeah. book to really expand on this? So I was, in 2018, I was watching you know, the fallout from the Me Too movement, and I thought, okay, it's great that we are understanding now that this egregious sexual assault can happen. Like, I, you know, that's great. That's obviously a, a huge revolution, but it struck me that this marginalization that the, that the women at MIT had talked about in some ways was a more pervasive problem and a more stubborn problem because it is so hard to see. And so I thought if I could tell this really intimate story about what happened to Nancy and these women, people would begin to understand the problem and do something about it. The exceptions, Nancy Hopkins, MIT, and the fight for women in science is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, his team's full of cheerleaders showed up for a state competition. A school turned up with a team of one. Why a student ended up competing all by herself. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting to be asked to host the Oscars again, but... Well, let me be perfectly clear. You were not my first choice. In fact, we asked a lot of people before you. Well, I'd rather not know who they were. Let me tell you. Steve Martin, Steve Carell, Steve Buscemi, Steve Austin, Steve Seagal, Steve Urkel. Steve from Blue's Clues. That's just the Steves. Did you ask Steve Harvey? Begged Steve Harvey. He would have been good. Steve Harvey would have been incredible. Are you kidding me? <laughs> With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. All right, so what do you do when all of your fellow cheerleaders quit before a big state competition? One high schooler decided to go it alone. Will Gans has her story. Forget bring it on. <laughs> Katrina Coel is bringing it by herself. <laughs> the high school senior competing in state championships as a squad of one. A week and a half before the state competition, uh, my three teammates quit. Katrina's coach giving her the option of bowing out of the competition as well. Automatically said, you know, I want to go and I still want to compete. I, I want to finish what I started, you know. It's been a lifelong dream of mine to be a cheerleader and I didn't want it to end because they quit. Most of the uh, cheer squads at state competition have anywhere from four girls to 20 girls. And then there's you. <laughs> and then there's me. <laughs> Katrina taking the mat by herself. <laughs> the crowd cheering on the solo cheerleader throughout her one-woman routine. It was exciting, nerve-wracking, a total adrenaline rush. Katrina, as a squad of one, earned her high school the highest ranking it's held in three years at the state level. What did it teach you about yourself? It taught me that... I can step outside my comfort zone and it, it'll be okay. Um, it taught me that I'm stronger than I think I am and that I can do anything I want. I just have to be willing to work for it. Stronger than you know, Katrina. What a message for us all. Our thanks to Will for bringing us that. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com.